Okay, it's time for our next online lecture. Today, uh, we'll be discussing electromagnetic waves in dissipative materials. In particular, we want to understand the role of conductivity and the dielectric function in determining how the waves travel through materials. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what happened last time. Uh, last time we were talking about um, what happens when I have a wave traveling in a, in a, in a dissipative material. And to, to treat that, um, what we did was we, we started with the Maxwell's equations, of course, which are um, our familiar Maxwell's equations, the easy ones are the del dot E is zero. We know that del dot B is zero. And uh, of course, Faraday's law is that del cross E is negative dB dt. Those are the easy ones. But in a material, all the interesting physics comes from Ampere's law. That's the hard one, but that's the interesting one too. Because Ampere's law gives us the cross product, uh, the, the, the curl, del cross B is equal to um, mu epsilon naught DE DT, the displacement current, uh, plus, but now we have this term, the polarization, the time dependent polarization, and that's where all the interesting physics is for materials. It's all happening right there. That gets two stars. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, to understand what happens in that polarization term uh, and how that affects wave behavior, we have to have a model for uh, what, what polarization means. So, so we can't, to get polarization in a material, we need to make some assumptions. We need a model. Of, of the material behavior. And our favorite model, and one that works extraordinarily well, is the simple harmonic oscillator model. So basically we're saying that a material is a collection of simple harmonic oscillators. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, we talked about that last time, and so here I'll draw it, just to remind you of where, what we're doing. If I have a material here, then I can think of it as having a bunch of simple harmonic oscillators, um, each with charge and mass hooked up to a wall, and there's some um, a spring constant K, and there's a whole bunch of them. I'll draw them here, and they can move in response to the electric field. That's the distance X. Uh, and also, they can they have a velocity, too. Uh, and so here's a, a wave coming. That's my electromagnetic wave. And, um, and that wave is what makes that charge go up and down. Um, and there's also, uh, and the dissipation here, we have dissipation. Um, and there's a dissipative force, which is negative gamma V. And you guys have all seen that before. That's the that's syrup, and so for this model, um, we have the polarization um, is equal to the dipole moment per volume, and so for one dipole, you know that the dipole moment is Q times X, just charge times position. Um, but for a bunch of dipole moments n in my material per volume then this is my polarization. I have n dipole moments per volume. And so we see that um, we know that nq over volume is the charge density. And so my polarization is just the charge density times x, where x is the, is the position of the charge, but it's the, it's the simple harmonic oscillator response. That x is, this x 
is this x. I just want you to understand, to really see that. And so, and so that's, so we have the polarization is rho x, and so the time derivative of the polarization is going to be rho uh, v, where this is the velocity of the simple harmonic oscillator uh, charge. That's, the, again, the simple harmonic oscillator response of the charge to the electric field of the wave. Um, and so that's the critical thing to understand, to, to, to realize that. And that is going to feed back into, uh, that is, this is going to feed back then into Maxwell's equations to, to help us understand how waves travel through material. This simple harmonic oscillator response is going to feed back into the Maxwell's equation. <clears throat> okay, so so now we we have some uh, we have some limits. Well, well, first, if you solve, we solved the simple harmonic oscillator, something you you guys have done in previous classes. And when we solved the simple harmonic oscillator, we saw that p dot equals rho v, the 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 time derivative of the polarization uh, is equal to uh, we we solved it. Um, and it's uh, minus I o omega Q over M times E divided by uh, omega naught squared minus omega squared minus I omega gamma over M. Uh, and this is, and we did this using, remember, we did it using F equals MA, our old trick. Mm -hmm. um, F equals MA of, of a simple harmonic oscillator. And that's something you've all done before. Um, <clears throat> and so this is sort of complicated. Let's just take a look at it and realize that it's a little, even though it's a simple harmonic oscillator, it's kind of mm -hmm. complicated. And so what we do then is we take limits. There, and there's a couple of important limits. And the first important limit is uh, the limit of no dissipation. Let me, I think I'll write it up. I think I'll write it here so I have more room. This is the limit of no dissipation. And that's where gamma equals zero. The syrup is gone. Uh, and so we saw that when we took a look at this thing for no dissipation, what we saw last time is that um, we, we have um, um, we, we, uh, we, last time what we saw, uh, we saw that we have, uh, if we write the, the electric field and the velocity, uh, then we see that they're out of phase. So if I draw one like that, then the other has to go like that. Can I draw it out of phase? Yes. I did it. Woohoo. I practiced. Um, and so this is E and this is V. And they're 90 degrees out of phase. 90 degrees out of phase. And why is that important? Well, the reason it's important is because the power absorbed, power absorbed, by a material, I should say by material, the power absorbed by the material, the, the electromagnetic wave power absorbed by the material is, is going to be, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be proportional to, or it's going to go as the time average of the electric field dotted into the velocity of the simple harmonic oscillator charge, the time average. And so we saw then that if you look at this time average, then this time average is zero for this case. It's zero if this uh, uh, phase difference <coughs> is, is 90 degrees, pi over two. If the phase difference between E and V is 90 degrees, then the absorbed power is zero because the average of E times V is, is zero, the time average. We did that last time. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, 
And I should say that in this limit, in this particular limit, I should say, then the physics is dominated by uh, simply the uh, index of refraction, n, is the most important thing. And the physics in this limit is just dominant. It just essentially can be this. Just we can just say that the the phase velocity, the velocity of the wave, uh, becomes not not the simple harmonic oscillator, but the wave. Remember, there's all these different velocities, but the wave velocity. That's why I put the little pH there. Um, the wave velocity is just going to be the speed of light divided by n, and that's that's what's happening in this limit. In this limit, so it's an important limit. Uh, I would I would call it sort of the the boring dielectric limit. Boring dielectric limit. Just sort of a boring insulator. Uh, but then there's a more interesting limit, depending on your point of view, of course, <coughs> uh, where you have high dissipation. And that limit is uh, is this one, where, where now uh, we look back at this formula that we derived here. Um, and what we do is we let, we let um, gamma over m get big. Uh, is, is, the, is the high definite? Well, that, I'm not going to write it here. That messes up the, the notes. I'm going to write it here. Uh, the high dissipation limit is when gamma over m is big. And big means it's much bigger than omega or omega naught. Uh, and so in this limit, we solved that. E we looked at that equation, and we see then uh, that we get uh, this very simple result, which is that the velocity, the simple harmonic oscillator, the charge velocity, the, the velocity of the charge in response to the electric field is... Um, is simply Q over gamma times the electric field. Um, and so that means that uh, then what happens is we see that the, the P dot, the polarization, which is equal to V times, uh, uh, which is equal to uh, rho times V, in this limit we have that uh, the, pol the time dependence of the polarization is just going to be rho q over gamma times e. Just plugging those in, um, and and this of course is just sigma times e, where this thing is sigma, our conductivity that we we have seen in the past, and so really this is like this is simply just saying that j equals sigma e, and we know that because j is equal to p dot. Just to remind you. Um, and so this is the Ohm's law limit. Ohm's law limit. And in this limit, the, we have a, a conducting dissipative material. Conducting dissipative, highly dissipative material. I'll say highly dissipative material. And what happens now is we see that P dot is equal to sigma e. The the P dot, which is the basically the current due to the, it, it, it's it's like J equals sigma e. Where now this is the current due to the polarization. The the pol we can call this the polarization current. Polarization current. It's basically saying that the material, the charge in the material is moving due to the electric field, and that creates current. P dot is polarization current. Um, okay, uh, and in this limit, then we saw that now, uh, if I plot uh, the electric field and the velocity of the simple harmonic oscillator, we see that they're in phase. And now I have E and V in phase. The phase difference between them is zero. And so now I see that the E dot V, the time average, is, is a maximum. 
does not equal zero. And so we have, so now we have dissipation. And dissipation means that power is absorbed by the material. That's how you get absorption of electromagnetic waves. You need this dissipation. And this is the most highly dissipative limit. Now, I do want to say that there's a third limit, which is the intermediate limit. And we'll be talking about that one later. Inter in the intermediate limit, which is, which is uh, the most general limit, then I have uh, gamma does not go, I should say that uh, gamma, the, the dissipation uh, does not equal infinity, and, and, but gamma also does not equal zero. So it's the intermediate limit where gamma over m can be on the same order as omega or omega naught. Uh, and so that's the intermediate limit. And, and we'll talk about that uh, later. But first, in this high dissipation limit, we see that the physics, in, in this high dissipation limit, the physics is determined by the conductivity, by sigma, the conductivity. And, in, and now, so we see these three limits in this in this boring dielectric limit, the physics is determined by n, the index of refraction, the no dissipation limit. In the high dissipation limit, the physics is determined by the conductivity. And in this intermediate limit, the physics is determined by uh, epsilon, the dielectric constant or permittivity. People often refer to it as the dielectric function But in this class, we've been calling it the permittivity. Doesn't matter what you call it. It's the same thing. Um, and so people often talk about these three limits. And so that's why this topic is confusing. It's, lot, just, it's all quite simple stuff. It's just simple harmonic oscillators and Maxwell's equations. But it gets confusing because there's these three limits. The, uh, the, the, low dis the, the no dissipation limit, the high dissipation limit, and the intermediate limit. And people talk about them separately, but it's really all one unified picture. Uh, but it, it seems like they're separate because people talk about them separately. And I, I also am talking about them separately because uh, it's important that you understand the three limits. Uh, and, and they're treated often separately. But really, they're all just one unified thing. So the, the, the limit that we've really already studied is the no dissipation limit. So I'm not going to talk about that. And last time, we were talking about the high dissipation limit. So today, we're going to continue talking about the high dissipation limit. Uh, and we're going to finish that off. And then, and then we will talk about the intermediate limit. But first, so let's continue with the high dissipation limit. Continue high dissipation limit. And in this, and so now you see what this limit is. This is the limit of a uh, highly conducting, highly conducting. It's the Ohm's law limit. This is the highly conducting, highly dissipative limit. Highly dissipative limit. And in this limit, uh, then I have p dot. Well, actually, it's not right there. That's right here. I have that the, pol the time dependence of the polarization is equal to sigma e in this limit. We derived that using the simple harmonic oscillator model. Okay, so so now let's use it, and now let's ask ourselves, you know, how does this affect wave motion? How does this affect wave motion? And that's really another way of saying, it, 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 basically I'm saying if I have some material and I shoot a wave at it, there's my wave, my electromagnetic wave, and this material has some conductivity, sigma, then what happens? What's going on inside of that wave? What, it's another way of saying, how do waves travel in conductors? How do E and M waves travel in conductors. That's what we're about to solve. And 
And so to answer that question, we have to, of course, you guessed it, solve Maxwell's equations. So let's do that. Let's solve Maxwell's equations to really see how waves move in this limit. And so here they are, once again. I never get tired of writing them. They're so cool. Del dot E equals zero. Del dot B equals zero. Faraday's law. Del cross E equals negative DB DT. And now, uh, of course, the most important one is uh, Ampere's law. And Ampere's law is, uh, the, is the new one. Del cross B is equal to mu naught. I'm sorry, not mu naught. It's mu. Let's get all these little things right. Epsilon naught. <clears throat> DE DT uh, plus mu DP DT. Uh, I'll write it like this. I use this, this other notation. I'll just call it mu times p dot, because that, of course, tells us what we're going to do, because now, basically, we're just going to plug in, what do we, so what do we do now? We just plug in what we got from the simple harmonic oscillator, and we got, we plug in p dot equals sigma e, and this was a result for the simple harmonic, this was, remember, we got this from the simple harmonic oscillator for gamma over m way bigger than omega or omega naught. Just reminding you where we got this from. But this is the limit we're in. So let's plug it in. Plug it in there. And see what happens. So Ampere's law becomes now del cross B uh, is equal to mu epsilon naught DE DT plus mu sigma E. Oh ho. Aha, uh -huh. a clue. So um, we see that uh, this becomes Ampere's law. And so now this is going to affect the wave equation because now, now what we do now is let's derive the wave equation for this modified Ampere's law, for this new Ampere's law. So let's now, let's do our, let's derive wave equation again. We've done it before. So let's do, let's do the same thing we did before. And so you remember how we derived the wave equation before. What we can do is it's, is, is it's really simple. We, we can start with uh, uh, Faraday's law, del cross E equals uh, negative <coughs> dB dt. And then let's just do that trick that we did last time. Let's do the curl of both sides. See, just do the curl of both sides. It's really simple. The math is not hard. Um, and then when you do the curl of both sides, then this one is equal to, I can bring the curl inside, and so that becomes um, negative d dt of del cross b, right? And then on the left, I have, uh, uh, this turns into uh, del times del dot e, using this famous uh, vector identity, calculus vector identity minus del squared e, right? That's what that equals. We've seen it before. And then it becomes minus d dt. And of course, for this, I'm just going to plug in this. Yay. And so this becomes mu epsilon naught de dt plus mu sigma e. Not too hard. And then del dot e, of course, we know what that equals, zero. Uh, and then I have these negative signs across that plus and plus. Um, and so now I have um, del squared e is equal to mu epsilon naught, second derivative with respect to time of the electric field, plus mu sigma times the first derivative with respect to time of the electric field. This is our new wave equation uh, in a conductor. So this is our new wave 
equation for conductor. And it looks a lot like our old wave equation, right? Because this is the old wave equation here. The old wave equation is just basically saying, for the old wave equation, we say that the second derivative with respect to space is proportional to the second derivative with respect to time. And the proportionality constant, of course, is the velocity squared. But for this new wave equation, we have a new term here. And that's, that's uh, something new and confusing, because new things are always confusing. Um, and so we have a new term. And what does this new term do? What is the effect? What is the effect of this new term? That, that's what we need to figure out. What is the physics of this new term? And before we dive into that, let's just remind ourselves that we see this, because I don't want you to forget that there's also B fields, and we can do the same. The same thing is happening for the B field. Same for B field. The same thing is happening for the B field. I just want to remind you, because we always, often we neglect the B field, but the same thing is happening for the B field, because uh, we can, we can, um, uh, uh, we could start, we could do this whole uh, derivation like this. We could, do the, we could do the derivation for the B field also by starting this. Del cross B is equal to mu epsilon naught dE dt plus mu sigma E. And then we could do curl of both sides. We could do this, del cross. And then we could do this del cross of both sides and then we could then we'll get you would do some manipulations and I'm not going to do them you should do them yourself and you'll end up with del squared b is equal to mu epsilon naught d squared dt squared b uh, plus mu sigma db dt same same wave equation for b I just want you to know, to know that. So, so it's okay for us just to focus on the electric field, and the B field kind of comes along. Okay, so then we have to ask ourselves, um, what are the solutions to this new wave equation? Because that's, that's, that will tell us how waves travel. We have, to, we have a new differential equation. We have to solve it. What are solutions? What are the solutions to the new wave equation? Solutions to... This new wave equation, because that will tell us how waves travel in a conductor. So uh, let's let's do it. And so, how do you do it? Well, let's just assume that we have our old wave solutions. Let's, let's just assume a solution, and then what we'll do is, and then we'll, what we'll do is we'll plug it in. And then this will give us a constraint. And this is a, this is a common strategy. When you're faced with a strange differential equation, what you often do is you, you can assume a familiar solution, plug it in, see what happens, and what, you, what, you, what pops out is some kind of mathematical constraint. And for waves, this mathematical constraint has a name. We call it a dispersion relation. What pops out is a dispersion relation. So let's do this strategy, this common strategy that you've seen before. Uh, and so let's try, um, let's consider this, our favorite solution. And you know what that is, a plane wave. Consider a plane wave solution. That is our favorite solution, a plane wave solution. We love plane waves, physicists love plane waves. Um, so, <clears throat> so we're gonna plug in E, the electric field, as a function of um, position and time is equal to some polarization, E naught, times this uh, wavy part, E to the I, K dot R minus omega T. So let's plug this in and see what happens. And then the, the I will just, I'm gonna jump to the end. I'm not gonna jump to the end, but I'm just gonna foreshadow things. The constraint that we will get is going to be a is going to be a relationship by plugging that in. We're going to get a constraint that relates k and omega. That's the dispersion relation. 
Okay, so let's plug it in and see. So this is how we're going to do it. Uh, let's take this wave equation. Um, and our wave equation is this. I'm going to re rewrite it in a funny way. Not that funny, but just convenient mathematically. Uh, del squared minus mu epsilon naught second derivative with respect to time minus mu sigma first derivative with respect to time times e equals zero. So that's the same equations. I just want you to see. See, it's this equation. I just pulled everything. I just pulled this stuff on the right over to the left. I want you to see that. And then, and then it's the same equation as this. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to plug it in there. Um, and so what happens then is when I plug it in, I'm going to have this. Now I'm going to take that. I can think of this thing in front as an operator. And I'm going to take that operator and hit this thing, E naught, E to the I, K dot R, minus omega T, equals 0. And so what happens when, when um, del squared hits it? Well, when del squared hits, when, when del squared hits this thing, the beauty of complex numbers is that it's really simple. It just brings out the I, K. Um, and we get ik squared. Um, and then, and then when the second derivative hits it, minus mu epsilon naught. And the second derivative, it's really nice because when it hits that complex, when that that thing, it's going to pull out minus i omega squared. That's the second derivative, minus mu sigma. And what's the first derivative? Well, that's just minus i omega. That's why we love complex numbers. Look how simple that is. Ah, we love complex numbers. This is so great. It makes the math easy. And then I can divide out the uh, I can divide out by the e naught e to the i k dot r minus omega t part, and so it just goes away. And so I'm left with this equation. I'm left with this thing is equal to zero, um, and this thing is uh, minus k squared, uh, and here I have, uh, let's get everything right, the, the pluses cancel, the, minus, the i goes to a negative, let me see, yeah, negative, and then that cancels that, and so this becomes a plus mu epsilon naught omega squared, uh, and then I got that plus, the negatives cancel, it becomes plus mu sigma omega i, mu sigma omega i equals zero. Okay, that's my constraint, or dispersion relation. That's my constraint, or dispersion relation. And so this is really important. So this give all the information is in this little equation, and it was so simple to get, because basically this is saying that the, the, the reasoning in your mind should be, is you're thinking, you should think like this, if I send a wave through the material and if the wave looks like this, E naught, E equals E naught, E to the I, K dot R minus omega T. If I send that wave into the material, then there is a physical constraint that exists between K and omega. There's a relationship, and that relationship is this thing, this equation. That's the dispersion relation. That's the, and the dispersion relation is the relationship between k and omega. And that's just, I just keep harping on this because that tells you everything about how the wave travels. It tells us how the wave travels. All the information is in that dispersion relationship. So let's take a closer look at it. The dispersion relationship tells us how the wave travels. It's the most important thing. And some of you might already know that. And if you didn't know that, then then now you do. Uh, and so today is a, a useful day. Um, so, okay. So let's take a look at this dispersion relationship. And the first thing that we notice is that it's complex. Oh my God. 
it's complex. That that's pretty weird. Uh, let's write it down. K squared equals mu epsilon naught omega squared uh, plus i mu sigma omega. And so this is basically telling us something. It's telling us that k is complex. Oh my god, k is complex. So that's pretty freaky, but it is what it is. And that's very important. So, so sometimes k is complex. And so, uh, so that means that k has a real part plus an imaginary part. And and so it's it's a complex it's complex. And so I'll write k sub r is equal to the real part of uh, k. But uh, kappa is going to be the imaginary part of k, and k is a complex number. And so what that means then is. I can separate the the real and imaginary parts of K, and so let's do that. Let's let's find. Let's find the uh, real and imaginary parts of of K, and the way we do that is is just some very simple math. We do this. Uh, we 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 know that from this, if I write K squared, then I see that I can just square that. It'll be K R plus i kappa squared, and that's going to be equal to just doing simple math on the complex number, which you've all done, is going to be kr squared minus kappa squared um, plus i times 2kr kappa. Um, and then I'm just going to equate it to this guy, because this is k squared, and so is this. And so that means that the real part uh, of, of these, I have two equations. Uh, I'll, I'll write them, well, I just don't feel like writing them all down. I'll write them down here. This equals mu epsilon naught omega squared plus i mu sigma o omega. And so that means that the real part must equal the real part and the imaginary parts must also be equal. So let's equate the real and imaginary parts. And so that means that uh, from the real part, I have k sub r minus kappa squared is equal to mu epsilon naught omega squared. And the imaginary part, I have um, 2 k r kappa is equal to uh, mu sigma omega, mu sigma omega. So I see that I can equate the real part and the imaginary parts. They're, they gotta be equal, simple math. And so now I have, well, you guessed it, two equations uh, with two unknowns. And so I can solve them. And it's easy. Just a little bit of algebra, and so that's so. I'm not going to do the algebra. You can do that yourself. I suggest that you do it. And when you do it, you see this. You get the answer. The answer, yay! The answer is this. We see that the real part of k k sub r is equal to omega uh, times the square root of mu epsilon naught over two. It's kind of an ugly formula, but it's a very important formula. 1 plus sigma over epsilon naught omega squared uh, plus 1 square root. And the imaginary part is equal to similar omega times the square root of mu epsilon naught over 2 times, <clears throat> it looks almost the same, but it's not, uh, 1 plus sigma over epsilon naught omega squared. But now there's a minus 1. Ha ha ha. The other one was plus 1, and this is a minus 1. 
one half. So that's the only difference. Um, and so this is the answer. And so one thing I just want you to notice, uh, so we gotta talk about physics because this is just equations, but just, just one thing I want you to notice before we move on. Notice in these equations that kr and kappa go to infinity when sigma goes to infinity. I just want you to see that. You can look at it and see. You can see that when the conductivity of a material goes to infinity, the weight, basically the wave vector uh, goes to infinity, the k's, both the real and imaginary part of k go, go to infinity also. You can just see that. Okay, but what does it all mean? What does it mean? What is the physics? What does it all mean? Good question. The first thing to notice is, is that uh, is that k is is complex. Okay, so k has a real part plus an imaginary part, and so then what does this imply? This is very important. Now I know that some of you have already seen waves with imaginary components with complex wave vectors, but some of you have not. Uh, and so if you've never seen a wave with an imaginary wave vector, then this is your lucky day. You're so lucky. Uh, it's such a great thing. It's very important. Uh, it's, a, it's a big deal in physics. It happens all the time. Um, Ks are often uh, imaginary or, or complex. And, this is, and so what it implies is that you have um, a fall-off. The wave dies. The wave falls off and dies, uh, and it's easy to see that. Uh, let's 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 see how we see that. So let's consider uh, let's consider a wave traveling in the z direction. Consider wave moving in z direction, moving in z. Ooh, like that. Okay, I got some wave map traveling in the uh, z direction. Um, and so um, let's take a look at it. So I have my e, my, uh, um, the whole, what a wave is, of course, is, is the electric field. So the electric field is now a function of z and t. And so uh, that can be written as um, it's a plane wave because that's what we're talking about. We solved we solve the equation for plane waves. E to the i uh, k z minus omega t. So that's my plane wave traveling in the z direction. Okay. Well, what 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 is what is going on now? Now what we're going to do is let's plug in the complex k. And so now my wave looks like this. E of ZT is equal to E naught E to the I KR plus I kappa times uh, Z minus omega T. Now let's multiply this guy out because he's going to multiply both of these guys and we see that this is equal to um, E naught times E to the minus kappa Z times E to the I KR Z minus omega T. And there you have it. So now you can see that's my X. I have an exponential fall off. Exponential fall off. And this is my. This one looks normal. This is my normal traveling wave. Normal traveling wave. So I get a normal traveling wave multiplied by an exponential fall off. <clears throat> so what does that look like? Well, it looks like a normal traveling wave multiplied by exponential fall off. Um, and so what we get, I should call this damping. When a wave dies, we call it damping. Such a nice euphemism for killing that wave. Um, okay, so we have the electric field. Um, 
and we see that we get uh, wave is damped. That's the word we use. It really puts a damper on things. The wave is damped by the uh, by this falloff factor, e to negative kappa z. And so when we draw the wave, it looks like this. And this is the wave, so you can see that it's oscillating. And this is t. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's, I can plot it by t or z. I'm sorry, this should be, this is not t, this is z, <laughs> oops, z. And so you can see that uh, as z gets bigger, the wave gets smaller. There's a, there's a, an envelope, an envelope. So this is the exponential envelope, exponential envelope. which is this factor e to negative kappa z. So it's falling off. You see there's this envelope. And so uh, what you can see is that the wave is traveling. It's still traveling. It's still moving. Still moving. But it's as it's but it's as it's moving, it's moving, but as it move but as it goes into the material, it dies. But it's still moving. It moves into the material and dies. And it and it has a speed. There's so the, the, the speed it's still traveling with a the speed. There's still a phase velocity. There's still a phase velocity which is um which is um omega over kr. And you can see that because if I have e, what the hell? if I have e equals e naught, e to the negative kappa z, e to the i k r z minus omega t, then you can see that this is still equal to e naught e to the minus kappa z. Uh, times uh, e to the i k um, r times z minus omega over k r t, and so this remember this is this is a function of uh, z minus v t. That that's what a wave is, but in this case the v is equal to now k r. Over, um, oops, getting that wrong. The V is equal to omega over kr. Okay, so it's still traveling. That that part is still traveling, but it's damped. Uh, and and then we can say there's a damping coefficient because if it's if it's damped uh, as I go to z, then e to the negative kappa. Z, I can write it as e to the negative z over delta, uh, where delta is equal to 1 over kappa. And delta is the falloff length, because that's the distance where it, it, uh, in that, because in that distance it falls, it goes by e. It falls off by 1 over e. In distance equals delta, then um, then then e, the way the electric field falls by a factor of e to the negative 1. That's, that's the definition of a falloff distance, um, the 1 over e falloff distance. And so we often will say that delta is equal to the skin depth skin depth. And what is the physical interpretation of delta? That is simply, that is how far the wave penetrates. The penetration depth. Penetration depth. 
And what that means is that if I have some material and the wave is coming at it, and if this material is conducting, then I see that the wave can get into it, but it's gonna fall off. So the wave gets into it, but it falls off over distance delta. So it can only get in a, de a depth delta. It can only, the, the electromagnetic wave can only penetrate the conductor by that distance. By distance equals delta. Mm -hmm. Now, what is delta? Well, delta, I mean, we just derived, it's really simple, it's one over kappa. What is kappa? Well, kappa is the imaginary part of the wave vector, which we just derived a few minutes ago. We got this whole formula for it. It's this thing. Um, remember, it was omega times uh, square root of mu epsilon naught over two, and I had the times the square root of one plus sigma over epsilon naught omega squared minus one uh, to the one half. But now I have to do to the negative one because this is kappa to the negative one. And, and remember that in the limit of high conductivity, then we saw that kappa went to infinity. Right? And so what that means is that in the limit of high conductivity, then the penetration depth is zero. And so as I have a, so uh, basically waves have a real hard time getting into highly conductive materials. So if material, if material has higher conductivity, then wave penetrates less. And that makes sense because it's the, it's the charge that's screening. It's the, the charge will respond more easily and it's that polarization that kicks out the wave. Polar, the, it's the polarization, it's the polarization of the electrons, the polarization that um, uh, repels the wave, polarization um, repels the wave. Which makes sense because polarization is what, remember polarization, polarization kills E. And you guys all remember that because when I have a conductor in DC, the electric field is zero because the conductor polarizes and it, and it, the polarization kills the electric field. And that's just what's happening here. And so more highly conductive material, the polarization works better and it kills the E and so it doesn't let the electromagnetic wave in. Okay, so um, now, <clears throat> now we're ready to, to see. So, but now let's, but now let's take a, uh, but let's take a look at this. Let's, let's consider this situation. So now I'm gonna ask a question. Uh, so now we're ready to answer a very important question. How much of the electromagnetic wave is reflected? How much E is reflected by a conducting surface? By conductor, I should say. How much? And so this is the situation that we want to solve now. I have this situation. I have the electric field. It's, it's coming in. I got my, my incident wave, K incident. And that's my electric field. Uh, that's my incident electric field. And I got, and this is, let's say, uh, a non-conducting material, like a piece of plastic or air. This is material one. And this is my conducting material. Uh, I'll call it material two, my conductor. Uh, and then I got my, I got my electromagnetic wave. Oh, that was the worst wave I've ever drawn. Uh, I got my 
my reflected wave, uh, E reflected, K reflected, it's coming out and you know, it's bouncing back. And then I got my transmitted wave, K transmitted. And the question I want to ask is, what is um, the magnitude of the reflected wave over the incident wave? What is the magnitude of the transmitted wave over the incident wave? Basically, how much is reflected and how much is transmitted? We did this for a regular dielectric. Now let's do it for a conductor, where this is a conductor and this is a non-conductor. We're ready to do this now. So let's do it. Um, <clears throat> so let's solve this. And so this is just like the Fresnel equations. Same as the Fresnel equations. Same treatment. As the Fresnel equations. We did this already. It's exactly the same. And so remember for the Fresnel equations, we started with the boundary conditions. Start with the Maxwell equation boundary conditions. Remember we derived these boundary conditions and you were wondering why we derived them. Now you can see why, because we're using them all the time. So let's, let's use the boundary conditions. And so the ones that we need, there are four boundary conditions. Remember the boundary conditions are on E perp, E parallel, B perp, and B parallel at the interface. Let's only use these ones. These ones, it turns out, are enough. Let's use these two. So we'll call this one um, uh, number one, and we'll call this one uh, number two. And so equation number one is the boundary condition on the parallel component of the electric field at the interface, which we've done, and we know what it is. We know that it's continuous. The electric field on one side of the interface is equal to the electric field on the other side of the interface. And now let's use boundary conditions number two, which is on the B field. And here we know that the it's the H field that's continuous. Not the B field, the H field, because we have no, there's no free charge or free current in this situation. And so the H field is continuous. Uh, and so that means that we have one over mu one, B one parallel is equal to one over mu two, B two parallel. Those are the two equations that we're gonna use. Okay, so how do we use them? Well, let's do the Fresnel treatment. So first, let's, we have to draw the electric fields. We have to sort of see what they're doing at the interface. So draw them, draw the electric fields at the interface. What is happening at the interface? Well, this is what's happening at the interface. I got an interface, I got material one, I got material two, I got sigma equals zero here, I got sigma not equal to zero here, and now let's draw these waves so that we can match these boundary conditions. So this is the incident wave, and so this uh, is the incident electric field. And let's, let's consider I just want to say, let's do, let's make it simple. Let's just do normal incidence. And that means that theta i equals um, zero. Okay. So let's just do, no it's easier that way. The, the angle of incidence is zero, so that means that the angle of reflection is zero, and that means that, the, of course, theta transmitted is zero too.
So this is called normal incidence. And so um, I draw the electric field, it's perpendicular to K, and, I, and let's draw the B field too. It's coming out. It has to, because remember, uh, remember that uh, K is proportional to E cross B. This is how I remember it. And so that means that the B has to come out of the board, because E cross B has to be pointing in the direction of K. Um, and then I have my uh, reflected wave. And so it's looking like this. Let's draw it. E reflected. And now the B field has to point in B reflected. Has to be pointing in, in, so that E cross B is, is in the right direction. And here's my transmitted. And I'll draw the E like that. And you might be wondering how I knew the directions of these E's uh, B transmitted. It has to be like that. So uh, I, the only one that we really start with is, is the incident electric field. But for these uh, reflected and transmitted electric fields, I just picked one. I picked a direction, and, and it didn't matter. I could have picked the other direction, and it would still work out. So uh, it, it doesn't matter which one you pick. Whether you because I could have picked it going down, but I picked it going up. It's okay. Either way would work. You just get a sign difference in the answer at the end. Okay, so let's use the, let's do the boundary conditions now. Let's do boundary condition one. Boundary condition one is saying that the uh, parallel components of the electric field are uh, equal. So on the left hand side, the the parallel components, the total parallel electric field. Um, so I have E1 parallel is equal to E2 parallel. And on the left-hand side, the E1 parallel is going to be EI plus ER. Because you can just see here how they, uh, how, how they add up on the left. And then, of course, there's only one of them on the right. So this equation is very easy. That's it. Yay. Um, <clears throat> and now... Let's do, uh, now let's do equation two. Equation two is the magnetic field one. So we have um, one over mu one, B one parallel is equal to one over mu two, B two parallel. Okay, so uh, on the left hand side, we see that uh, B one parallel uh, looks parallel to the interface, looks like this. I see that I have BI is coming out of the page, but BR is going into the page. i got to subtract. They're in the opposite direction, so they subtract. And then BT is coming out of the page, 1 over mu2 BT. Okay, so that's equation 2. So those are my two equations. And so now what we want to do is we want to get rid of... Um, we want to get rid of the Bs. And so the way to get rid of the Bs is um, we got to uh, just remember a little bit of Maxwell equation stuff. Remember, uh, we did this before. Uh, del, remember from Faraday's law, we have del cross E is equal to negative dB dt. And this, this is, should be familiar. Uh, and then if I have a plane wave, then for plane waves, if I plug them in, plane waves is like E, B is proportional to E to the I, uh, K dot R minus omega T, right? Um, and so for plane waves, if I plug that in, then I get um, I, K, cross E, because the del turns into an IK, is equal to, and the DDT turns into um, a negative, negative I omega uh, B, remember? Because that's, that's what the time derivative turns into. And so I get, um, and then the, now the I's cancel, and I get K cross E 
is equal to uh, omega b. And since everything is perpendicular, then I know that f for the polarizations, I can always write uh, k e naught, the polarization, uh, is equal to omega b naught. And so that means then I can write that b naught, b, the b field, uh, is equal to uh, e times k over omega. Now, you've seen that before, because that's just the same as saying b is equal to uh, e divided by omega over k. And we, know what, we all know what omega over k is. That's just the velocity, e over v. So we, we, we remember from before that b is equal to the electric field divided by velocity. We remember, we re, we've used that. But here's the trick. There's a trick now. The trick is that k is complex. And so we, we're not just going to call this v. We're going to leave it as k over omega. We're not going to call it omega. We're not going to turn it into v. What was that? Um, so we're not going to, we're not going to call it, we're, we're not going to do this. Don't. Don't do this. We're not just going to turn the omega over k into a velocity. We're going to leave it as k over omega. So now, so wherever we see a b, so that means that wherever we see a b, we're going to turn it into an e times k over omega. That's our trick. Uh, and we're going to stick with it. That's our trick. Yay. And so we're going to plug these guys now into here. And so let's plug it in. And so we get, and so now we get our two equations. Um, uh, remember, our, I'll write it again. Our, our equation one is the easy one. EI plus ER equals ET. But now we have equation two. And equation two is going to give us, using this trick, it's going to give us, on the left-hand side, we have... Um, well, on the left-hand side, the conductance is zero, and so we can do, we can use, I should say, don't do this for conductor, but we can do this for the other side that's not a conductor. And so for the side that's not a conductor, we can just say that uh, B is equal to E over V. My... Um, Actually, let's just let's just do this all. Let me spell it all out so it doesn't get confusing. This is going to be bi minus br equals one over mu two bt, <clears throat> and so what I'm going to have is one over mu one, and so the b on the left hand side is simple. That's just going to be e over v because this is the non-conducting side, right? But on the right-hand side, it's more complex because now it's going to be, I have to have K2 over omega ET. See? See? So this is where I'm going to do this trick because K2, I have to remember that K2 is complex because it's in a conductor. We derived it. It's that big complex expression that we did. And so, okay. And so now uh, let's, let, now the rest is just algebra because now I can see then from this equation two that I can get um, E I minus E R is equal to mu one V one over mu two omega times k2 times et and so what i can do is i can say i can call this then ei minus er is equal to beta times et 
we're beta. Oops. Where beta is equal to mu1, v1 over mu2, omega, k2. Okay. Uh, and k2 <coughs> is complex. That's that expression that we derived. <coughs> because that's the conductor. That's the k in a conductor. So there's a real and imaginary part. So beta, so then we see that beta is a complex number. And that's what makes this different from the previous situation. That's why this is different from the Fresnel equations. Different from the Fresnel equations that we did before. And so, okay, so now we have these two equations. Where are they? This is equation two. This is equation one. And, and now they're pretty easy. And now they're easy. We have two equations, two unknowns. So solve two equations, two unknowns. And you get this. We get ER, um, the reflected electric field, is equal to one minus beta over one plus beta times the incident electric field. And we see that the transmitted electric field is equal to two over one plus beta times ET. Oops, not ET, EI, EI. Um, Okay, so this is the answer. And this is, ba it's just like the, it's similar to the Fresnel equations, but a little different because beta is complex. And so uh, that is the answer, uh, but let's, but what is the physics? In other words, what, what's happening? Let's think about it for a second. Let's look at beta. We see, here's beta. So let's consider a limit to make it easy to understand. Consider a limit where the conductivity is really high. So this is for a really strongly conducting material, like gold or silver are highly conducting. Sigma goes to infinity, sort of like gold or silver. Copper also is pretty highly conducting. So we have these, okay. And so then what we see is that um, beta, Ew, it's a terrible beta. We see that beta, another terrible one. We said beta is proportional to k, the, the k in the conductor. But we remember that the limit of sigma goes to infinity of k2 is equal to, you guessed it, infinity. Yay. And so we see then that uh, beta goes to infinity. Did I get that right? I hope I got that right. Yeah, beta goes to infinity. And so for the in the limit, um, it's the limit of sigma goes to infinity of beta is equal to infinity. And so that means then that in this limit, I have ER is equal to, let's go up here, minus beta over plus beta is just equal to minus one. EI and also ET is equal to zero. So there you have it, and that's very intuitive because you see everything is reflected, nothing gets through. So, uh, uh, so everything is reflected. And that's why metals are shiny. This is why this explains why metals are shiny. I'm so shiny. Shiny and reflective. Because this is the behavior of a, a mirror. We just derived a mirror 
That's what mirrors do. We see that the the um, the polarization flips. Polarization flips, but everything is reflected. In other words, when I say everything reflected, I mean all of the electromagnetic wave intensity is reflected. And the polarization flips by 180 degrees. Yay! Um, okay. So um, that, that is the main thing that I wanted to, um, to say. Um, and so uh, just, I just want to recap this. And so I just want to say that um, we've now treated two limits. So we've treated two limits. Here's a summary. We've treated two limits now. We've looked, to, we've looked to see how waves behave in this limit where the dissipation is zero. And I have a material, as, remember the material is a collection of simple harmonic oscillators. And in the in limit of, of zero dissipation, then uh, everything is pretty simple. And I can just say that the, wave, the, the waves travel just like before in the phase velocity, the velocity of the waves in the, in the material with no dissipation is just equal to C over N, speed of light divided by index of refraction. And the other limit we've treated, we just finished right now. It's where it's the highly dissipative limit. Gamma over M is really big, bigger than omega or omega naught. And so this is the highly dissipative so this is uh, the no dissipation limit, and this is the high dissipation limit, high dissipation, the high dissipation limit. Uh, and then here at this limit, we get um, uh, skin depth. We get uh, K equals complex. We get um, a real part and an imaginary part. And we get um, a skin depth, delta is equal to 1 over kappa, the skin depth. And we see that, um, we see reflective behavior. We see that the metal wants to reflect the electromagnetic re radiation. That's what we just saw. But now, uh, the last limit... So, but now we, we have the third and final limit, the final limit. And the final limit is the intermediate one, of course, the hardest one, but it's not so hard. It's not, but it's just a different limit. It, it's an intermediate limit. Uh, and, and, we, and we saw that, oh, and I just wanna say that for this reflective behavior, we saw that uh, for the, for the for the delta, the skin depth, and for the reflection coefficient, or the you know the the er over ei, we see that the most important parameter is sigma. The physics is determined by sigma, the conductivity. Uh, so here, the physics is determined by the index of refraction, and here, the physics is determined by the conductivity of the material. But now let's talk about this intermediate regime. And I just, uh, we're, we'll, we'll end in just a minute. I'm not going to get into it too much, but I just want to sort of summarize things. For this intermediate regime, what we have is we have the intermediate regime. 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 Dissipation. In other words, we have that the, the dissipation gamma over m factor is on the order of the frequency or the uh, resonant frequency omega naught. Um, and so, and remember this. Remember, we're always talking about this is the situation we're talking about. A material is a collection of simple harmonic oscillators, q over m. The, and the, 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 the charge is connected to a spring. 
Q over M, Q and M, and the motion of this charge is X, the distance, the polarization, and it can have a velocity as well. Um, and there's dissipation, gamma, which is the syrup. Syrup, that's the dissipation. And so now let's talk about this medium regime where we have medium dissipation. And so what in this regime is the most important thing? How do we figure, what controls the physics here? And the most important thing is that controls the physics here is the dielectric function, epsilon. Or as we've been calling it, the permittivity. And now that's the most important factor in this regime. And this is the most general case. And so it is useful for us to just remember what dielectric function is. Um, I just want you guys to, to, to remember what, what the dielectric function is. And <clears throat> the definition, the most important definition is this, the polarization Polarization is equal to epsilon naught chi E times the electric field. And where epsilon then is equal to epsilon naught 1 plus chi E. Where chi E is the susceptibility, the electric susceptibility. And, and this is the most important thing. That's where the physics is. Physics is here. So what we have to do is, uh, we, what we have to do now is we have to understand chi. And we and and we have we have to understand chi. And we have to understand how chi affects uh, electromagnetic wave motion. How does an electromagnetic wave respond to chi? If there's and chi is the electric susceptibility, and if I have a given chi. Then how does the electric how does that affect the, the motion of an electromagnetic wave? And so that's what we will do next. But this is a good time to stop. Until next time, bye-bye.